This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by the Ledger Nano S, the hardware wallet which sets the new standard in security and usability. Get it today at ledgerwallet.com and use the offer code EPICENTER to get 10% off your order. And by Jax. Jax is the user-friendly wallet that works across all your devices and handles both Bitcoin and Ether. Go to jax.io and embrace the future of cryptocurrency wallets. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And I'm Meher Roy. Today, we have a very special episode for our listeners. We're going to talk to Mona El Isa and Rato Trinkler. They are co-founders of a project called Melon, or Melon Port. And they're building what is, what might just become in the future, the network of blockchains and a decentralized asset management software to run on this network of blockchains. But before we get into their vision and what they're doing, let us have a quick intro from the two of them. Starting first with Mona. Mona, can you tell us a bit about your background and how you came to be involved in the blockchain industry? Sure. Um, I started um, my career in market making and trading equities at Goldman Sachs uh, back in 2003. Um, And then in 2011, I I moved to the hedge fund world and uh, became hedge fund manager, uh, running a part of a long short uh, multi-strategy portfolio. Um, And about uh, just over a year ago, um, I decided to take some time off to explore the world of blockchain and uh, in particular some of the uh, use cases for the technology to enhance what felt like a lot of inefficiencies in our industry. Uh, met Rito pretty soon after that and uh, we've been working together pretty much ever since. Cool. And, and, and Rito, tell us a bit about your background. When, when, since when have you been working in this space and what have you been doing? Um, hi, I'm Rito. Um, I have a background in mathematics from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. Um, I've been following Ethereum more or less ever, ever since I first heard of it. Um, I've been working at BrainBot Technologies um, and now I'm uh, working at Mellonport, who is building the Mellon project. So as uh, Mayor kind of put it at the beginning of the show this is this is sort of a, a a fundamental new concept that we're going to try to dissect today and uh, we've we've been reading the white paper and in fact our listeners should know we tried to record this episode um a couple of days ago and weren't able to really construct a, a, a sort of clear and sensible um you know, framework for how we're going to explain this. So we said, okay, let's let's come back on it and, 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 and try to explain it again. So I hope that we get it right this time because it is fundamentally something that uh, is quite different from anything that we've seen before. And, and to me, it sort of feels a lot like when we first started talking about Ethereum uh, more than two years ago and that it, it's completely novel and it requires you to have a, a, a new type of outlook on how you consider... Uh, what a network looks like, and especially in the context of blockchains. So um, Polkadot is, uh, and I'll, I'll let you uh, sort of explain it, Rito, is a network of networks. It's it's a network of blockchains. And specifically what it would allow uh, is for different blockchains, um, depending on, uh, regardless of their size, their functionality uh, of the types of industries or people that they cater to, to interact together and to be interoperable and essentially allowing for one blockchain to trigger events in another blockchain, uh, which would in fact allow this interoperability that so much of us has been sort of talking about and that that has been um, uh, defined as one major problem in in the blockchain space is how do we get blockchains to interact together? and so Polkadot, the, the white paper came out uh, a few days ago. It was written uh, by Gavin Wood, uh, who was famously one of the co-founders of Ethereum. And uh, I think this is probably one of the first times that, you know, the, me- the, the blockchain and cryptocurrency media will try to, uh, to, to, to dissect this. So I, I hope we get it right because it is very fundamental. So I, I'd like for you, Rita, now to explain sort of your vision of what Polkadot is and what it's trying to solve fundamentally. So 
we kind of see it as 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 the internet of blockchains. Um, if if you look at the Bitcoin blockchain um, and kind of see it as a as a database, as a decentralized database, um, and we look at Ethereum and kind of see it as a world computer, as a decentralized computer, um, and and we have all these different variations of it, like Cinero and and all of these um, kind of other computer-like structures, um, then we can see Polkadot as, as the layer which finally um, connects all of these computers and databases. So in a sense, um, what, what you're trying to say is um, that we fundamentally have a sort of a coordination problem among, among, among these different blockchains, right? So historically, when we when we look at our industry, we have uh, we have kind of thought in terms of there's going to be one individual blockchain. Initially, with Bitcoin, we said okay, there's going to be one individual blockchain, one individual currency to rule them all. You know, everything else is going to perish. There's going to be one blockchain with this one currency, and it'll be the blockchain, quote unquote. Right? That's where we started. That's where our industry started. Then came Ethereum and in Ethereum it said, okay, we don't want to be really thought of as a blockchain. We, we want to be thought of as a world computer. So it's, it's a, it's a blockchain that is generally enough to really be thought of as a computer. And although Ethereum never said it explicitly, when you say world computer, you assume that there's, there's, there's going to be one single one of them, because if, only if there's one single network like Ethereum, does it become the world computer? But if there's like hundreds of them, then there are hundreds of these, right? So somewhere intrinsically, we were thinking, okay, there's going to be one big one giant world computer. And now with, with Polkadot, I, the way I interpret your statement, Rito, is, is saying, like we have to kind of cast aside these ways of thinking that there's going to be one winning network, one winning blockchain, one winning world computer, but rather think as, that there are going to be a lot of different consensus computers or there are going to be a lot of different blockchains and they are all going to sort of coordinate together with each other, work together with each other and they are going to form a network of blockchains and this network of blockchains will be singular. Like this will be the fundamental unit by which kind of our, our industry is organized, right? Would you agree with that? I definitely would agree like that there will be different computers, different databases as there already are now. Um, I, th I think that's it's a good point that, that I think it's unlikely that there will be one winning chain to rule them all, but there will be different chains with different abilities and different use cases. So I think, and, and like all, all, all the credit goes to Gavin, like I think that the genius of, of his proposition is, is how loosely he defines basically what can be included into this network. Um, so it doesn't even have to be, I mean, essentially it just needs to be a data structure that is validatable and globally coherent, and then it can be included. So it, it, it can even be a private chain, it can be a consortium chain, it can be you know, chain with proof of work, proof of stake, proof of authority. It's, it's interesting, yeah. So before our show, we were kind of discussing different ways in which kind of we could explain this general concept itself. And we, we thought of a different analogies, like, like Rito came up with one analogy and like I came up with another. So one way to think of it is the way like that kind of Kind of kind of Rito uh, Rito is going to use during the show, which is that notion that in the beginning we had like computers, right? Like so, the computer industry for since the nineteen fifties until the nineteen eighties probably they were individual computers, right? And then for the first time with the notion with the development of TCP and IP, you kind of built a network of computers where processes running on one computer could communicate to processes running on another computer. And we built a network in which uh, all of the computers in the world could just be plug in, plugged into. And, and the idea is you start to think of an individual blockchain as an analog of a 50, 1950s or 1980s computer, which is like kind of standalone, not able to interact with other 
blockchain networks. And now the idea bit behind Polkadot is, hey, can we build this new network that allows all of these blockchains to kind of coordinate amongst each other, to run processes that are shared between blockchains. So something happens here, something happens on another blockchain, something happens on another blockchain, something is triggered on another blockchain, things like this. That's one analogy. And then the other analogy we kind of came up with is uh, this kind of problem has been solved by other kinds of technologies as well. So uh, because I'm from a biology background, the way I think of it is that if some of you know that like in biology, we have cells, right? So the human body is made up of cells. And if you go back to the history of biology in the form of evolution theory, then the cells were invented like three and a half billion years ago. And then for the next around three billion years, the world only had like single cells. These were like bacteria and these were like archaea. They were the different kinds of cells that existed in the world. And like 600 million years ago, roughly, give or take a few hundred million years, a few tens of millions of years, these cells learned how to coordinate with each other, like work together to form organisms that consisted of not of one cell, but like of multiple cells. One of the fundamental you know, inventions that biology did was the invention of the nervous system. So if you think of the, your nervous system, your brain and spinal cord, what it's allowing you to do is there are cells in your, in your, in your feet and there are cells in your hand and these two need to coordinate in order to do something, right? And your nervous system solves this coordination problem for these cells, right? The leg can do something, send a message to the cell of the hand, hand can do something, send a message to the cell of the leg. So this coordination problem was solved for cells. This coordination problem was solved for computers. And here we are kind of asking the question, can you solve this coordination problem of sending information between blockchains for blockchains, right? So that's what we're gonna be talking about. Uh, right, Rito, do you have anything to add to add, add to that? Or perhaps you could develop your analogy of networks of blockchains further. Yeah, I think that um, there can be a lot of analogies drawn and in a way like we, I mean, <clears throat> like, yeah, you, you kind of mentioned it already. Um, the way kind of I see it is like if, if we go back um, 60 years in history, then or fix, uh, 60 or so years in history, then we kind of see these big old clunky databases kind of developed by IBM and, and biggest houses. Um, and then as history progresses, we see kind of they get, um, they improve a lot, these databases, and finally we kind of get to computers. Um, so essentially we add logic on top of these databases and get computers. Um, and then we go further a bit in history and, and, and we have all these different computers and essentially the invention of the internet comes up and, and we connect these computers together. Um, and in a way, it's, it's, it looks somewhat similar in, in the blockchain space. So we, we kind of start with databases. Um, so, it, I mean, if we, if we look at Bitcoin as a database, which is very secure, but also has kind of is its room for improvement. Um, and, and we kind of go a bit further in history there and we kind of have the next big peak, which is kind of, in my opinion, Ethereum, um, where we have this concept of database and we add logic on top of it. Um, the genius of Vitalik Buterin. And now it, it really feels to me like, like we, we move a bit further and now we're at this other peak where we kind of, we, we see all these different databases and all these different computers with all these different functionalities um, and now we can connect them. So, and, and um, in, in a way it's, it's <laughs> in a way it feels like, I mean, if, if you look at traditional computers and it feels to me like the, the last big invention in, in traditional computers was kind of the internet. I mean, we had, we had a lot of, you know, we have a, a AI and we have, you know, super high performance small computers called mobile phones and, and they have all these things but it feels to me like the, the last big invention was the internet 
And in a way, this might signal in a bit philosophical way, but in, in a way, this might signal um, the last big peak of innovation in, in the blockchain space as well. So now we start to connect them. There, there still will be so much room for improvement and all of these great features will come, but it might be the last big logical step for a while. It's fascinating how you talk about it as, as a big peak in the space. Like the space is only, what, eight years old? And yes. <laughs> already we're talking about perhaps like coming to the end of innovation in, in this space. Uh, it, it, you know, if you compare that to the internet, what did it take 50, 60 years before that happened and sort of, you know, the sort of computers coming together and, 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 come, and participating in the network, which is the internet. Um, what, what I like about that analogy is that what, what the internet did essentially is it, it standardized communication between all of these systems that were very unstandard. So, I mean, today we, we take it for granted that 20, 30 years ago, computer systems were very different and very incompatible. Um, and, and the internet sort of enabled standards to, uh, to emerge. And now uh, you have uh, different types of processors, right? So you have uh, Intel or like ARM chips or any type of internet of things connected device, which is running on some other type of chipset to communicate with each other through these standards that are well established in the industry. But 20, 30 years ago, like that was not a given. Um, and that's what sort of the internet and TCP IP enabled. And I, I see this as that leap, right? With blockchains is this network uh, protocol that would enable for a, a standardization at the communication level to occur, not standardization of features, you know, because like CPUs, like processors, computers, whatever, each of them has their own functionality and, and, and that's important. But we need to have a, a common language, a common protocol that enables secure, efficient, and fluid communication between them. And uh, this is, the, as, as I start to construct my mental model around this, this is how I, I'm, I'm seeing it. Let's take a break to talk about the Ledger Nano S, the new flagship hardware wallet by Ledger. I'll pass it over to Ledger CTO, Nicolas Baca, who can tell you all about Ledger's security features and SDK. The Ledger Nano S is a personal security device based on a secure element, a screen and button, so that you can verify everything that is done on the device and make sure that you are really doing what you want it to do. Compared to our previous solution, this device is based on the latest generation secure element, the ST31 from STMicro. The ST31 is, an, is using a secure ARM core, which means that you can have the same ease of development that you would have on a generic uh, microcontroller, but benefit from the security features of a secure element. Security features uh, include an application firewall at the lowest level that lets you protect applications from each other, which means that you can load multiple applications on the hardware wallet, even post-issuance. And you as a developer will be able to leverage these features to load your own application without our authorization and without any kind of authorization from the vendor. We will be providing this device with an open SDK um, that lets you do anything you want with this device. We provide sample applications for cryptocurrencies, different cryptocurrencies, so Bitcoin, Ethereum. Uh, and we will also provide a FIDO authenticator and you will be free to add everything you like. For example, you could add some secure messaging, some encrypted chat, and you'll see that the solution is quite powerful and very easy to develop with. The Nano S sets the new standard in hardware wallet security and usability. You can get yours today at ledgerwallet.com. And when you do, be sure to use the offer code Epicenter to get 10% off your first order. We'd like to thank Ledger for their support of Epicenter. So let's, perhaps dive in a little deeper. I think we've you know, sort of covered the, the analogies of what this looks like and what this enables. Let's talk about some of the core components of Polkadot. Uh, and I think it's important to um, define two uh, of the core components. One is the Polkadot chain itself, which in the white paper is called the relay chain. And essentially that's what it does. It relays communications between different blockchain networks, which in the Polkadot uh, context are called 
parachains. So could, could you expand on that, please? Sure. So maybe, maybe we start with parachains. So parachains are essentially defined as validatable, globally coherent, dynamic data structures which kind of has, you know, Bitcoin-like blockchains, which has, which has Ethereum-like blockchains, which has, which has a consortium-like or even private, private uh, chains. Like it kind of encompasses all of them because all of them are validatable and all of them are globally coherent. Um, so essentially, yeah, if, if we see these parachains as data structures and data structures can also be computers or in the in the analogy could be like a smart a smartphone or like a high performance computer a very secure computer and and we kind of plug them in to the network and then it's kind of we need to have this this tcp or or essentially we, we need to have some sort of layer that they can kind of talk to each other and this kind of layer of, of talking to each other, as you said correctly, is, is, is the relay chain. So the relay chain essentially relays information from one chain or from one data structure to another. That's a great start, right? So there are, there are parachains and then there are relay chains. So if you think of it like parachains, you can think of as cells or organs. The relay chain is like your like a spinal cord that relays messages between, communications between the, between them, right? Now let's kind of start imagining on um, on a deeper level what happens inside a parachain. So perhaps we could st start with imagining uh, like just one parachain network individually. And could you explain to us who are the um, important participants in one parachain network and what their responsibilities are? So essentially, if we start at a, a parachain, and we said they need to be validatable and globally coherent. Essentially, validatable is, is kind of the need to be some sort of state transition function. Um, or, or in other words, there needs to be some mechanism to check whether or not the next block makes actually sense. And sense can just be like whether or not kind of it's within, like within some standards of bookkeeping like if somebody just wants to add a million to his or her account that essentially would break these standards of bookkeeping and then the block wouldn't be valid so that that's that's essentially what is meant by a state transition function so okay if we start at the parachain then we have uh, the participant called a collator and what a collator does is essentially uh, he or she runs a full node of this parachain and just kind of um, delivers block to validators. And, and validators are participants in Polkadot which kind of just apply this state transition function on this incoming block. So they just kind of, so this is in order that validators don't have to have a full node of each blockchain or of each parachain. They just kind of need to have this this state transition function, so so they only need to kind of validate if the next step or the next block actually makes sense. So and kind of these validators are are split into subgroups and each subgroup and randomly um, selected, and each subgroup is kind of responsible for one parachain. So it kind of starts with subgroups. They validate. All the transition of all the um, um, parachains, and then it's kind of once this happened, it's kind of it it tries to seal it into one relay block, which is kind of from all the subgroups into one relay block. Let's let's try to kind of break down what you said. I think what you what you said is like a great summary of the system, right? And and we'll try to kind of break 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 this thing down by taking uh, a couple of examples. So you started off with this notion of there being a parachain and uh, these participants in the parachain, which you call the collators, right? So let's let's imagine uh, that that there is like one parachain, we, for, for purpose of simplicity, we'll call it parachain one or P1, right? 
Now, now P1, it, P1 looks pretty much like Ethereum, right? Um, it has the same functionality in, in Ethereum. And let's say Reto, U and I are the collators for, for P1. And there's already been a million blocks in P1, right? And now a new block needs to be added. So the million and million and first block. So how does this block get added and what do we do in the, in the process of adding the million and first block? in P1. The Polkadot network would kind of vote on whether or not to include this um, new parachain. Um, and once this is approved, um, the essentially you and I, the collectors of this parachain, would supply um, the information to validators. Um, yeah, and essentially validators apply state transition function check if everything makes sense and yeah kind of once this happens for for all the parachains gets into a, a relay chain block and kind of included into the relay chain so uh one thing i think is perhaps important to uh to define is the the validators uh essentially uh, if we think of traditional blockchains today uh the the miners or stakeholders or what, whatever validating node uh, we have has this role of a collator and a validator in one. They they collect transactions and build the blocks and submit the blocks to be validated by the network. Uh, in in this uh, in this configuration, those roles are separated. So we have the role of the collator who. Um, assembles transactions to be sent to a validator, and, and that validator does the the, the work that, um, let's say, like a miner or a proof of stake validator or any like if we take like Tendermint, um, like a validator in Tendermint, they add the block to the network. Is that an accurate representation? Maybe maybe we need to introduce. That there's also the concept of nominator. Okay, so essentially, I, I would see validators as the analogy of, of a mining pool. Um, and nominators are people who have a stake in Polkadot, um, but just kind of want to uh, nominate a validator to kind of do the validating on behalf of them. Um, so these people would probably be considered as the miners, uh, the validators as the, the mining pools. And the collators just as, as the people who kind of run a full, full node, who do the heavy work essentially, who deliver the data. So these validators are are not individual to one parachain, right? So uh, we, we imagine this one parachain P1, it, and the two of us were collators to this. And then we might in the, in further imagine another parachain like P15, and Sebastian and Mona will be the collators uh, collators for this. So if you have like two different parachains, P1 and P15, uh, how will the validators, like who selects the validators for these parachains? And how are the validators initially selected at all? The validators are selected randomly um, into these subgroups. So there, there's kind of two steps of, of validation. There is the validation of the individual parachain, and there's kind of the validation of the overall relay or of the overall Polkadot network. So it's kind of two times validating. So Reto, you've have, you have, you have kind of, you have walked through this uh, concept of uh, the parachain and there being collators inside the parachain. And then uh, we introduced like a new party, which is the validator, right? So can you tell us who is a validator? How is the global pool of validators created? And then uh, further, uh, what kinds of interactions exist between validators? Essentially, a validator is can be seen as as, as um, participants who who keep the network secure. So essentially, people who put stake, like stake in dot uh, tokens, the underlying tokens of Polkadot, um, and bind them to the network. Essentially, with kind of vouching with these tokens for their accuracy of what they validate. So if, if they don't validate accurately, kind of their stake is, at, is in danger. 
um, these people will be selected according to a staking pricing algorithm. So the network needs to incentivize these people um, that they put stake into the network. Like this, the same way as um, in a proof of work network, there needs to be an incentive for people to buy hardware and to actually mine. And it's the same here. So the, the, selection, that's the selection process will be yeah, essentially an algorithm which kind of has as inputs like how much does a person want in return for their stake and how much stake is this person actually willing to commit. Um, and then once, once we have a set of validators, which as of now probably is 144, um, this set of validators need to be grouped into subgroups um, so that they can kind of validate the individual parachains. And this grouping is done randomly. So what you're in a sense trying to say is that there's this central relay chain that is um, essentially like a coordination chain that helps with the task of coordination. And the relay chain has this native asset, which is dot, right? So just as the Bitcoin blockchain has a native asset, which is Bitcoin, the currency, Ethereum, Ether, the currency, Polkadot relay chain has a native asset, which is dot, right? Yes. The unit is called a dot. And now um, this dot is like freely tradable on the exchanges like any currency. But uh, but w once, once let's say uh, a holder, like let's say Brian, like let's say he owns a lot of dot units. So let's say there's a million dot units and Brian owns, uh, so there's 100 million dot units and Brian owns, let's say 2 million of them. Then Brian can essentially uh, stake his dot units in order to become a validator. So he uh, hands over control of these uh, dot units to the network and in exchange, he kind of becomes a validator and then he can validate not only the relay chain, but some of the data of the parachains themselves. And we'll walk into how, uh, how, how that happens. So different participants, different owners of dots, can kind of deposit their dots and become validators. And this defines the global pool of validators, right? Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Today's magic word is dot, D-O-T. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. One thing that I, I, I'd like to make clear, as a, a new parachain, uh, let, let's imagine that uh, you know, there's a parachain, there's a, a polka dot network, and it is made up of N chains, and there's uh, um, there are many validators, and it's it's secure. Uh, as I, I want to create a new parachain, I want to create a new chain specific to uh, a use case that uh, let's say let's say I want to build a, a blockchain for the French insurance industry and I want to participate in the Polkadot network. What, what type of considerations would I have to make, whether technical, ideological, in the construction of my blockchain, would I have to make in order to participate in this network? So I guess the analogy is if, if I take the internet, if I want an internet connected device, I have to adhere to a certain set of standards which is, you know, TCPIP. I have to have a network card that is compatible with TCPIP and software, and like so there's the whole stack that allows my computer to communicate with the network. If I'm constructing a parachain uh, and I want to participate in the Polkadot network, what are the considerations I have to make to do that? that that's another um, really, feel, really, in my opinion, really a beautiful thing about this proposal. Um, Okay, so I, I usually see, okay, if, if we take Ethereum and, and we look at it as a computer, um, and then we take smart contracts on this computer, I mean, smart contracts on this computer can then kind of be seen as software running on this computer. So essentially with Polkadot, um, it's just a matter of downloading some software, like the analogy would be like a, a browser, and then you're connected. So, so Polkadot has this concept of 
um, break-in and break-out contracts. Um, and essentially, these break-in and break-out contracts are, um, yeah, enable this communication. So even, even with existing parachains, you just download essentially the, the browser software and then you're connected. So this, this software um, would need to, so let's take a concrete example. Like let's say I'm building a permission tendermint net style network or maybe Hyperledger, right? Like a permission network using one of these permission protocols. I would have to include libraries that would, that would speak the, the Polkadot protocol and include those libraries in my smart contracts? Is that? Um, I would see it differently. I would see it as, as special contracts themselves that have some special um, logging functionality. So if you send a transaction to them, they um, emit logs, and these logs are then picked up by the relay chain. So this is, this is, this is like the breakout. So if you want to send a transaction that goes beyond Tendermint, you just send it to this one contract and then it gets picked up by the relay chain and the relay chain um, sees that, okay, this transaction wants to get out. Uh, and within these locks, they're essentially, or within this transaction, they're essentially is the destination uh, parachain and, and the information it should contain. The other way is um, with um, so-called break-in contracts, but essentially, in the break-in contract, um, it validates if the, the transaction actually, you know, it, it checks whether or not the transaction actually has been validated by the Polkadot validators. So maybe we could take an example around this. So let's say, let's imagine two parachains. So one is parachain one, the two of us, Reto and I, you, we are the collators for this. And then there's parachain 15 and Mona and Sebastian are the collators for that. And somewhere on the background, there's like 144 validators of the relay chain network. And like say, let's say Brian and Gavin, like Dr. Gavin Wood, Gavin are two of these validators, right? So, you know, we have kind of personalized these. Now, now fundamentally, uh, what, what needs to be done is some, there has to be some way to exchange some message that might be starting from uh, parachain 15, so Mona and Sebastian's chain, and then it has, and that message needs to be processed by us, which is parachain one, right? So explain to us like, how would that happen? What is the difficulty in making this work? And how would that happen on the relay chain? We need to make two differentiations here. Um, should the transaction go directly to the other parent chain? or should it go to the relay chain and then maybe from the relay chain to the parachain? I think what, what you're asking is the, the, the direct route. Uh, no, let's, let's, take, let's take the indirect route from, from the relay chain to the parachain. Okay, from the parachain to the relay chain, it essentially uh, would be a special breakout, um, either contract or account, depending on the, the blockchain capabilities. Um, and, and this breakout, account or contract would essentially omit locks that are picked up by the relay chain. So the relay chain um, kind of recognizes that some, something wants to, to get out. And essentially it's, um, yeah, it, it will be picked up what is called um, egress transaction queue. Yeah, and this way essentially it's, it goes from the parachain to the relay chain. Um, and then from the relay chain to the destination chain, it would just be that the validator sign off that this transaction wants to get in. And in the break in contract on the other parachain, um, there essentially would need to be this, this inbuilt function that can validate the validators, you know, like an easy um, uh, recover function that essentially yeah, checks that this actually has been signed by the validators. And if so, it gets included. So we've talked about how 
new networks would be able to onboard Polkadot. So in, in my previous example, you know, one industry specific permission blockchain. Uh, can you talk about how easy or complicated it would be for existing networks such as Bitcoin or Ethereum to onboard and participate in the Polkadot network? Sure. Um, so for any, any kinds of blockchains that have some sort of smart, com uh, smart contract capability, it will be um, quite straightforward. Um, for Bitcoin, essentially that the problem that needs to be solved is kind of that on Bitcoin, there needs to be a way to validate, you know, that, that, tra that the transaction has been signed by maybe 30, 40 validators. And that as of now is, is quite difficult for Bitcoin. Okay, so it's a, it's a problem with multi-signatures then being limited uh, to a certain number of, uh, of signing parties? Yes, that's how I understand it. Uh, so then in that case, it would require Bitcoin to, for the, pro the protocol to, uh, to evolve in, in a way that it could, it could handle a large amount of uh, multi-signature, like a, a multi-sig uh, multi scheme where you have potentially like 30 or 40 uh, signing parties, which would represent the validators. Yes. Okay. Let's take a short break to talk about JAX. JAX is a multi-coin wallet created by the people at Decentral. Now in the past, if you had a whole bunch of cryptocurrencies, it was a pain to handle them. You either had to leave them on an exchange, which was insecure, or you had to have all these different wallets, which was a hassle. Fortunately, now with JAX, those medieval days of darkness, misery, and suffering are over. JAX supports multiple cryptocurrencies and new ones are being added. But it's not just storing cryptocurrencies you can do with JAX, but you can also exchange them directly from within inside the wallet thanks to their Shapeshift integration. And since there's only one seed, JAX makes it super easy to back up and sync to your other devices. JAX works with Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Android, iOS, and has browser extensions for Firefox and Chrome. So go to JAX.io, that's J -A -X .io, to download the wallet and get started today. We'd like to thank Jax for the support of Epicenter. So at this point, I would like to maybe come out of the technical uh, discussion and bring it to a higher level in terms of use cases and what this enables. So I'd like to get your, your thoughts, uh, perhaps Mona, you can address this on what use cases or what new types of business models uh, the Polkadot network would uh, would enable in the broader scheme and the sort of the broader uh, vision of a world with you know thousands, perhaps millions of blockchains. If we go back to the analogy of thinking about this as an internet or uh, something that connects these different uh, databases or networks together, one of the big uh, advantages you have of all of these um, transactions being decentralized or the relay chain being a decentralized process is that it's very secure. So it might not be as fast as a, a, an exchange of information on the internet, but it's extremely secure. And so the biggest value or the, the biggest use case I see for this would be exchanging things of value across chains. Um, and so when you think about that, then it, it kind of starts to make sense why we as Mellonport, who are building a protocol and software for asset management, we're so fascinated and exciting, excited when we heard or when Gavin opened up to us about the polka dot paper because it solves a really big problem for us. Um, we've been building Melon on Ethereum for a while now, um, but one of the big limitations we had and one of the things people kept asking us is how are you going to deal with assets on other chains if you want to truly be decentralized? And for, for us, polka dot really opens up this opportunity and it's kind of why we wanted to make it happen faster um, so that we could we could sort of uh, deploy Melon on Polkadot essentially from day one. Let's dive then perhaps dive into Melon then. So the what 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 you're trying to solve with Melon, uh, and and I'd like you to, to explain uh, essentially what Melon is and what you're trying to do is uh, being able to transfer assets or transfer value from one blockchain, let's say like Bitcoin, to another blockchain, like for instance, uh, decent uh, decentralized capital, uh, euro pegged uh, token, uh, or from an Ethereum contract token, you know, which represents some sort of asset to 
like a private chain that represents some sort of other asset. And you needed to have a protocol uh, or what you were missing was a protocol that would enable this uh, this transfer of value from one blockchain to another. Can you can you talk about that in, in the context of Melon and the business that you're building there, how Parachain solves that problem? So actually the, the Melon protocol itself is a protocol that basically um, enables people to set up funds in a in a kind of non-negotiable way. So it standardizes performances, so you can start to compare different uh, fund managers or portfolio managers. And it also stops the embezzlements of funds. So just like the Ethereum and Bitcoin protocol stop people being able to transfer a million dollars from one account to another, the, the Mellon protocol stops a fund manager just being able to transfer that money to his or her private, uh, another, another account, friend's account or whatever. So that's um, the setup process. And then there's this kind of management process. So we, I think this is the first proposition, at least that I know of, to set up and manage decentralized funds. But our limitation was that in order to stay completely decentralized, you have to, you, the only thing you can uh, keep in those portfolios, which by the way, there's a lot of uh, on-chain tokens on Ethereum. Um, but the real um, the idea becomes a lot bigger when you can start to gain exposure um, in those portfolios to assets on other chains. And maybe if digital assets become more mainstream, potentially one day on private chains or consortium chains. And, and possibly not just um, limited to tokens and um, currencies, but maybe one day you'll be able to hold intellectual property or uh, anything you can really imagine in these portfolios. So this, this polka dot element kind of really unlocks this for us because um, Melon starts to become a much bigger idea um, in terms of an asset management proposal. That's a very interesting concept. So the, 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 way, the way I'm kind of thinking of it is, so, so, so Melon, Melon the, the project itself is enabling like fund managers who are uh, who basically specialize in figuring out which places to invest money in, uh, set up their portfolio. So what, what a portfolio means is, okay, there's like, imagine like the smart contract system where uh, you can you can get investors to invest in your portfolio and then you will buy other assets on their behalf. And then when the other assets appreciate, some of these returns are fed back into this investor. And all of these interactions are managed by a smart contract system, right? Now, uh, in a sense, like a really good asset management uh, smart contract system would enable the, the fund manager to invest in a wide variety of assets, right? Like, for example, if I open a brokerage account in, uh, in the United States, uh, then maybe I can, as a fund manager, invest in like 5,000 different shares of different companies. So you, you want a lot of assets to be enabled for fund managers. And uh, a global network like Polkadot gives you exactly that kind of reach because there are lots of lots of different blockchains, lots of different assets. And then these fund managers would be able to hold all of the, these in their portfolios. Exactly, Maher, you've got it spot on. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's the reach, um, but it's also, um, we also profit from the extensibility. So the same way, you know, this, this internet can connect different computers with different abilities um, kind of we as the melon project can also kind of utilize this so if, if we have if, if we want to have um, like if we want to have our protocol on a chain that has zero knowledge proofs we might or we, we can essentially just take the idea that is the protocol and just implement it and deploy it on, on this computer on this chain essentially giving um, our users the option to now have this, these portfolios with zero knowledge proofs and not kind of um, dilute the tokens because it's all kind of, the tokens are kind of on the network um, so, that, so that there is no conflict of interest there. So that, yeah, that, that we can use. I guess to summarize, it's all about giving the user a choice and not limiting the user uh, in, any, in any way. So um, enabling them to invest in as many assets as possible and also to deploy set up and deploy their funds on uh, any any network they may choose in future. Um, because if we go back to analogies that we discussed in future, some people, if you're setting up a, a high frequency fund, you may you may choose a network or a, um, a blockchain that can, can handle high frequency trading. If you're mostly concerned about uh, privacy, you might 
uh, choose a different kind of blockchain. And so by having um, this flexibility, um, we kind of overcome this and become more neutral and just allow the user uh, to, to decide how they want to deploy their portfolio. And you can think of Melon at this stage as an idea that can be deployed on any network which has the flexibility to do so because of Polkadot. That sounds really, really interesting. So can you walk us through like, um, so you, we have walked through these two concepts. One is like the Polkadot network and then there's one application of the Polkadot network which would be decentralized asset management in the form of Melon. So can you walk us through like how you are planning to develop these concepts further? Because as I see it, like Polkadot is kind of a theoretical concept that was, that is a paper written by Dr. Gavin Wood. And then you yourself have a paper around how decentralized assets management would work on Ethereum. How does this get translated into reality in the future? Sure. I think the idea is that we recognize there are um, certain elements uh, such as deciding on, for example, the exact consensus mechanism um, or, you know, the exact inflation to build into some of these tokens, etc., that need to be further researched. And rather than rush them, I think the first thing we'll do is enter into a research and feasi feasibility study uh, together with, um, with the parity technologies. Um, the, the idea is that we have a, um, a contribution period coming up soon where we'll um, issue uh, tokens in both DOT and um, MELON. Um, and, um, and the initial uh, goal with these funds is to start with a, a feasibility study and kind of so Rito, uh, Rito and our team to work very closely um, with uh, parity technologies in, in terms of finalizing some of these details and making sure we uh, approach everything from, from, from the right uh, place. And once we uh, complete this feasibility study and conclude uh, that it will be possible, We'll continue with um, uh, the we as in Melonport will continue with the development of uh, Melon protocol uh, to a phase two um, where we hope to be able to go live and then we will enter into a development agreement with Parity Technologies um, to launch the um, the polka dot uh, to build the polka dot network which we will then deploy with Melon uh, onto it at, at Genesis Block. Okay, so. So, so this, as I, this, as I understand it, is like uh, in order to execute the development of, of both of these technologies, you're going to have this contribution period where you solicit uh, contributions from various people around the world. Do you have any timelines on when, when this would happen and what shape that would take? Sooner than later, I would probably say. Uh, the exact date hasn't been finalized, although I think we'll be announcing more information on that very shortly. Um, the contribution period will probably last uh, about eight weeks. Um, we will probably, uh, Melonport will facilitate the smart contract that enables the contribution period and we'll probably uh, be packaging the two tokens together uh, because we think it's a very um, uh, obvious fit that you sort of build a network and have the application side by side. Uh, so we'll package the tokens together and, um, and once we... Um, we raise a certain amount of uh, crypto funds, uh, we, we will enter into the plan that I just discussed with you. Great. Well, we're definitely looking forward to that, uh, hearing more news about uh, the development of, uh, of Melonport as a project uh, and also uh, of Polkadot as a network. Uh, it, it, it was hard to... To construct this in a way that uh, and that, that is understandable, but I, I hope that our listeners find that uh, we've um, dissected this uh, this concept in a way that is digestible and that you'll be able to understand. And I'm sure in the coming days and weeks there'll be articles and other podcasts coming out. You know that you can also watch or listen to or read uh, that will help you. You know also gain your gain gain more knowledge about Polkadot because I think it's a really fascinating idea uh that we're only starting to begin to see what the implications are what the ramifications might be in the future so uh good luck to you both on uh on these very ambitious projects thanks thank you very much guys and and congratulations on making it so <laughs> easy to understand round two <laughs> well well i hope so and thanks again for agreeing to come on a second time we, we kind of botched it the first time and and, and now we're uh, I, th I think uh, we've got something solid 
that uh, you know, that, that uh, people will be able to fully comprehend. So, uh, so thanks for coming on, and thank you to our listeners for tuning in. We are part of the Let's Talk Bitcoin Network. You can find lots of great shows on Bitcoin, blockchain technologies, decentralized technologies, and all that good stuff at letstalkbitcoin.com. Yeah, you can find us at epicenter.tv uh, or youtube.com slash epicenterbtc. And you can also find us wherever you get your podcast, whether that be iTunes, uh, SoundCloud, or any podcasting app. Uh, so thanks so much for tuning in and we look forward to being back next week.